Now this is contingency tables in uh, an association. <coughs> now we get some definitions. A contingency table, two-way table, relates two categories of data. A row variable, each row in a table describes a specific topic. Uh, the title of the topics is the row variable. Column variable, each column in a table describes a specific topic. And the title of the topics is a column variable. And cell is each box inside a table is called a cell. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> For this example, uh, we're doing education uh, across top, and then we got our hair color on the sides, and we're counting how many, for example, red, um, how many high school students have red hair in this uh, particular example. So it's 45. Now education is our column variable, and hair color is our row variable. The high school graduates with red hair would be in the cell in the first row, first column. So this 45 right here, first, uh, first column, first row. Now the marginal distribution of a variable, this is a frequency or relative frequency distribution, distribution of either the row or column variable in the contingency table. <coughs> And how we create one is we total all the columns and all the rows and put a grand total in the bottom right. And this is for a frequency marginal distribution. So for example, we had our original table and I uh, added the high school students together. 45 plus 90 gives us 135. The college, 33 plus 42 gives us 75. 2 plus 7 gives us 9 for the graduate. And then across uh, the rows, we took 45 plus 33 plus 2 to give us 80. 90 plus 42 plus 7 give, give us 139. Now for the grand total, you can either add together the totals in the column here, 80 plus 139 will give you 219, or you add together 135 plus 75 plus 9 will give you the 219. Oops. Okay, now creating a relative frequency marginal distribution, and these, these aren't that uh, difficult, that's why I'm not actually doing an example here, just using the one I have. It says total all the columns and all the rows, put a grand total in the bottom right, create a new row and column, divide each total by the grand total. And this is a relative frequency marginal distribution. Okay, we start with our original. Uh, we added our columns, 45 plus 90 is 135, 33 plus 42 is 75, 2 plus 7 is 9, and then our totals for the rows, 45 plus 33 plus 2 is 80, 90 plus 42 plus 7 is 139, and then our grand total. Then what you do is you take each one of these individual totals and you divide by your grand total. So I take 135 divided by 219, gives us a 60.616. Uh, 75 divided by 219, 9 divided by 219. Over here in the rows, 80 divided by 219, and 139 divided by 219. <coughs> Now we have a conditional distribution. This lists the relative frequency of each category of the response variable given a specific value of the explanatory variable in the contingency table. So list the relative frequency of each category of the response variable um, um, of each category. Okay, so given a specific value of the explanatory variable in the contingency table. Now how we do this is we total all the columns and all the rows. Decide if you're setting it by column variable or row variable. And divide each number inside a table by the appropriate row or column total it resides in. Now for example, we got our original table here. And we're going to look at this by education. So we've added the columns, added the rows just like before. Now notice we don't worry about the grand total on this, on this particular type. Then what we do, and this is in the bottom table, is we take the, each number inside each cell and we divide it by the appropriate total. Since I'm studying it by education, uh, for example, the 45 and the 90, I'm going to divide by 135. The college, um, 33 and 42, I'm going to divide by 75, the total at the bottom. And they graduate, uh, 2 and 7, uh, divide each of those by 9. Now notice I don't use the 80 and 139 at all um, on this one because I'm, I'm totaling it by education. Now instead, if I total this by, by hair color, then this one right here would be 45 divided by 80, 
This one would be 33 divided by 80. This would be 2 divided by 80. This one would be 90 divided by 139, 42 divided by 139, and 7 divided by 139. So you need to decide how you're studying it, by education or by hair color. Now let's talk about Simpson's paradox. This describes a si situation in which an association between two variables inverts or goes away when a third variable is introduced to the analysis. And this example uh, that the book has is excellent, and I would I would recommend you read it and and um, the full details of it. I'm just going to give a highlight here. But this was sex bias and graduate admissions, uh, University of California. They got sued, and uh, if you look at it. Uh, men um, was total of 2590. They accepted 1191, and they not accepted was 1399. For women, there was a total of 1835, and accepted was 557, and not accepted was 1278. And then total, um, you see down there. Well, looking at it, uh, the ones they not the ones they they didn't accept. Um, looks like about the same amount, doesn't it? So it looks like they're showing some bias against uh, against women in their acceptance. Well, what they did then is they looked at it per program of study. And um, the blue is the men and the uh, green is the women. And these were some of the, the areas where they had uh, the most uh, go into those programs. And by looking at each individual area of study, um, then they see that actually women uh, tended to be favored. There was more, percentage-wise, uh, there was more women accepted, um, or roughly equal down over here. Well, how can that be? Doesn't seem to make much sense when you first try to wrap your mind around the numbers. But, uh, for example, if I'm going to look at a program, let's say math, because, you know, everybody wants to go into math. And if I um, look at the women, let's say um, one out of two was accepted. Two women applied, one was accepted. Well, this one is 50%. If I look at the men, um, 480 uh, out of 1,000 was accepted. So 1,000 applied, 480 were accepted. So um, we look at this, it looks like, okay, women, the percentages were more. They accepted more percentage-wise. Uh, percentage so this is our largest program, perhaps. Yeah, so we look at that. You know, women, which one was women? On the, okay, on the right. Okay, here's men, here's women. There are more. No bias there. Um, now, think what this does, though. If you put the grand total of all the students in there, this one uh, for the grand total uh, for women and for men, uh, this added one in there. And this one added 480 in there. So when you start looking at the totals mixed in, uh, even though this percentage was lower in this program, this adds into the total, which makes it look skewed. And uh, here's how uh, Sullivan uh, relates it, and, and uh, this is verbatim out of the book. And I thought uh, Sullivan did an excellent job of summing, summing it up. The initial analysis did not account for the lurking variable program of study. There were many more male applicants in programs A and B than female applicants, and these two programs happen to have higher acceptance rates. The higher acceptance rates in these programs led to the false conclusion that the University of California, Berkeley, um, was biased against gender in its admissions. Now, I did a very radical example there with uh, like the 1 out of 2 and 480 out of 1,000. Um, but it, you, you help to see the, the problem there. So some, sometimes things aren't as clear-cut as they would seem at first. You have to study your data from uh, different angles to see if there really is, really is discrimination. So, anyway, that's the end of that section. So let me stop the recorders.